prefer to define it as the Southwest North American region in which the border is a recent imposition because people have to understand that the border is only two grandmothers old. That's it, right? Everybody considers the border as this kind of permanent fixture that goes together with the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Madre and the desert of Chihuahua and the desert of Sonora and the uh, archipelagos that exist between the two. So that I look at as the entire region, which extends basically from the Pacific coast of, the, of what is now the United States uh, through and including the Sierra Madre and of course the deserts of Chihuahua and the deserts of Sonora and everything in between. So I look at, that, at this as the Southwest North American region as an ecological space and place that's larger, larger than France, Germany, Spain, the Low Countries, Italy, and so on and so on. So that the region is much larger than the political entities that in fact inhabited it over time. So you have a Spanish empire that runs right into former complex systems. For example, the region itself consisted of a number of complex systems prior to the 13th and 14th century. So you had the uh, Hohokam, the, the Mogollon, uh, Casas Grandes, I mean, you name it. And these very complex systems that existed from, certainly from at least from about 700 to about 1300. Everybody looks at, at this region north of the border as kind of a permanent fixture, and it is now politically, obviously. But it is not a permanent fixture ecologically per se, because what occurred after 1848 was the establishment of two major uh, lines of uh, integration. One was trade from Hannibal, Missouri into New Mexico, and the other one was the creation of the railroad uh, in the 1880s. And so this, this established a kind of economic symbiosis between what became the Northwest Mexican landscape and the Southwest American landscape. But they were always integrated to, certain, to a certain degree economically. So you've always had this asymmetrical integration between Northwest Mexico and Southwest United States. And it's always been there up to this second at this, present, at this present time. So that the border has always been filled with holes. Because why? Well, because you've had this integrated political economy since uh, the beginning of the middle of the 19th century to the present. And a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of people don't understand even to this very second, all the maquiladoras all along the 2000 mile border are themselves the creation of post 1965. The first, some of the first maquiladoras were established in Nogales, which is only you know, 150 miles from, from where we are now and 60 miles from Tucson. <clears throat> the maquiladoras were established in order to sop up Mexican labor that had already been utilized in the United States during World War II. Mexico never left. I just learned English. <laughs> See, and if you take that position, then the border is pretty meaningless. Because it, what it is, it's a recognition of a historical relationship with an, with an area. It is borderless from that particular point of view, regardless of nationality, regardless of the border, regardless of anything else. And that leads kind of to, the, to a secondary position if you, if you assume that premise. And that is for Americans, the border is a place to stop. For Mexicans, it's a place to cross. It's a very different, very different premise. It's a place to cross because it was created. It was imposed. I mean, there are different fancy words for it, like annex, secession, and all the rest of that, but the fact that it's, it's an imposed line. And then you have the indigenous position. And the indigenous position is that the border split indigenous populations one from the other. And there is also no great love for the Mexican version of this either. Because the Mexican version also tried to impose its political 
idea upon indigenous populations as well. Uh, there are no good guys in all of this. Okay, the, the ones who really paid the price for all of this were, were the indigenous populations. We just happened to get mixed up with each other genetically. Yeah. The, 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 our Spanish forebears did not have uh, any reluctance to, in fact, engage in genetic transmission with indigenous populations that were here, either, either willingly or unwillingly, both. So we are all, uh, what, what was created was this, this mestizaje. So it, it is an attempt by, con all conquerors do this, by the way, they attempt to erase the history of the people that were already there. Certainly the Aztecs did that to the Toltecs. I don't know if you know this, but in fact, the Aztecs burnt all of the codices that the Toltecs ever wrote. The Spanish came along and they burnt all the, co the, the Aztec codices as well, except I think maybe five or six that's, uh, that are still existing uh, of the original codices. The American version of this is don't include any of this population as part of American history. So in a way, our presence has never been recognized as, as being one of, of either contribution or existence, except by stereotype. And that is that these, this mestizo population is only good for the back and not for the brain. It's good for the brawn, but not for the brain. So, so the population has been used as a commodity since, since the 19th century, but without a history.